Man, why do we complicate life so much? Isn't it supposed to be exciting, meaningful, and worth living it to the fullest? How do we get so mired down in the quicksand of everyday routines? But you know what? If we learn to identify what makes us unhappy, clarify the things that we need to change, and then solidify them with a plan of action, man, we can begin to heal our fears and frustrations, which will in turn open new doors of possibility. That shift in our focus will inevitably manifest itself in our lives. Sit back and relax. I want to take you on an exciting expedition of faith, purpose, and fulfillment. It's also a journey through my own personal struggles, a devastating heartache, a loss, the failure that left me so broken, I thought I might never, ever, ever see the sun again. And in the center of that overwhelming pain, I found a plan patiently waiting. It's my wish, by sharing this story with you, that I can help guide you into the light of day. A life of daring determination, bold endeavors, and the simple joy of being alive. And if you're watching this now, I believe that is, too, is a part of the special plan. So listen closely for the answer to a question you've asked yourself many, so many times. Will I ever see the sun again? I can assure you the answer is yes. How do I know this? When I was nine years old, my family uprooted and moved from suburban New Jersey to a remote little town in upstate New York. There were no children living by. It was just a tall mountain overlooking the new home, but it was so dilapidated and filthy that it was nearly unlivable. Without friends and feeling lost, I would take a trek up this mountain, struggling step by step until I reached the very top of where I would collapse in the tall grass and feel the breezes gently blowing over me. That's where I would stare into the sky wondering what was to become of me. What was my life going to be like in the future? Thinking then that my dad, who has just been hospitalized with a ruptured ulcer due to stress, doctors tell my mom they weren't sure if he would pull through, and I wondered if I would ever feel safe again. It was a conversation with God, searching the creator of the universe, when I heard a voice deep within me speak to me in a way I had never, ever experienced before. It told me that I would be okay and that if I re would remain faithful and to stay the course, a, beaut a beautiful future filled with good things would be mine. Just like in the movie, A Field of Dreams, you know, that voice reassured me that there was a greater place and plan for me, though I couldn't see it at the time. It's then that I realized in order to stay the course, I needed to be an active participant in moving forward and not be a passive spectator. Soon my dad recovered, but unable to find work, he moved to a big city 60 miles away, which added to my loneliness and isolation. With many journeys, <clears throat> with many journeys to the mountaintop retreat over the next few years, at the age of 17, I made a decision to join the United States Marines. In 1965, I left that little town and all the painful memories it had for me. Life in the Marines changed me from a boy to man seemingly overnight. Soon I was deployed to Vietnam. When I met Yoon, we were coming back off of a night patrol and uh, we were coming down through this village and we had to secure the village. And I came around the side of this hut. There was a little girl standing there with her hands through chicken wire, because it was surrounded with chicken wire, and she was looking up at me, and when she looked up at me, I just knew, I just knew that, that, that there was going to be a connection, and I immediately thought about to the nine-year-old boy laying back on that farm hill, on that hill on the farm, and I thought of myself that I needed help, and I knew she needed help, so when I got back to our main compound, I went over to the chaplain's tent and I asked him, I said, you know, chap, can we, uh, can we do this for this little orphanage in town, in the little village outside of our compound? And he said, well, I got to gotta check on it, but I'll see what I can do. So he got back to me in a few days and he said, you know, that was a good idea. Let's have them over for Thanksgiving, the, 
the captain said he thinks it would be a good idea. It would be a way for us to interact with the village and maybe gain some trust and, and faith in us. So Thanksgiving Day arrived and Yoon and gee, I, you know, 30, 30 other orphans were on the back of a six-by and uh, they started piling off and Marines started pairing up with them. And it wasn't just about me, it was about other Marines and it was about other kids and children other than Yoon. But out of this mayhem of these kids having somebody to cling to, Yoon saw me. I don't know how she saw me because there was a bunch of Marines and there was a bunch of kids and we were all trying to match up. And I was just praying because it was never solidified that she would be with me. But she found me and I found her. In the twinkle of an eye, my life was changed. I, real, I instantly realized that the world didn't solely revolve around me, but there was so much more. I had been so self-centered and thoughtless, and I was the most important person in the universe. Man, how wrong was I? You taught me that life filled with love and direction can quickly turn into satisfaction and achievement. I wrote home to my mom and dad and said, take all, any and all money that I have in savings and send send clothes and some cash to, the, to our chaplain so he can, uh, he can get it to Yoon so she can start getting a better education, cleaner clothes, toothbrushes, toothpaste, just the necessities that we take for granted she didn't have. And I wanted her to have them. I wanted all the kids to have them. My mom decided to take it upon herself and start a... Uh, a clothing drive for children, for the orphanage. And it literally turned into a major, major uh, event for orphanages, not only where I was, but all over Vietnam for kids. I had already gotten out of the Marine Corps, but I had stayed in touch with him because of Yoon. I tried to bring her home. I tried to bring her back to the States, but I was a 18 year old Marine, not married. And you know, the Marine Corps isn't gonna let you let you bring a child home when you're not married, especially in 1966. And uh, so she stayed there and I kept on making sure she was taken care of. And then in 1968, I got a, a letter from, uh, from the chaplain at the, at the base there and he said, you don't need to send any money anymore. Uh, he said during the Tet Offensive, the orphanage was overrun. We don't know if you, if you was lost or not. And it's been my, my desire to find out someday, and I will, whether she survived the Tet Offensive or not, but compound was overrun and it just changed everything after Tet. And, you know, I was back here and couldn't do much about it, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a void in your life. But you know, I still have faith that she's where she's supposed to be and that all of this was for a purpose, purpose that I'm supposed to know about, but just a purpose, purpose to give me maybe this emotion that I carry with me because I'm an emotional person and I deal with them emotionally, but I control them. I know how to use them, but uh, I think God's plan for me was to do what I'm doing now, helping as many people as I can. That's why I believe in expectation therapy. Helping others always brings with it a reward and adds purpose to our lives. It fills us with compassion and purpose. If a life is a work in progress, then expectation is the seed from which it grows. Suddenly things become clearer and more manageable. It creates a pathway to trust transforming your inner dreams into outward reality, your destiny. In 2003, my wife of 33 years <clears throat> was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and fought heroically for three years. Several weeks before she passed away, she told me, you've been so good to me over the years, Art, 
And now I want you to go find someone who needs and loves you as much as you have needed and loved me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My wife was giving me permission to love someone else. I didn't want to believe it, but I realized she was giving me a gift. I can't imagine the strength it took to say those words to someone you love, but she did it. When she left us, it was a tremendous blow to our family and me. My children were devastated, and I was out without the love of my life. I struggled to find a new sense of normal without her. But in the years of emptiness that followed, I began to make poor choices and behave in ways I confess I'm not very proud of. I felt much like that nine-year-old little boy from so long ago and abandoned and scared. I finally ended up on my knees one night and I cried out to God for an answer. And again, I heard that same voice from inside saying, be faithful and stay the course and all that I have for you will be yours. After 51 years of believing in that voice, I couldn't deny it. It was so true and it rejuvenated me. It rejuvenated me to start living again. You know, I went out and joined several dating sites, but was disillusioned by the outcomes. Still, I continued to press on in my quest to find someone. Then one day, I came across the photo of a woman. Her eyes, her smile, her inner brightness captured my attention. We began corresponding, and a year later, we were married. My prayers were answered, and God's promise came to pass. I just had to stay the course. Don't let the, the what-ifs of life get you down. What if you try something new and fail? What if someone doesn't like what you're doing? What if, my, what if your life falls apart even worse? What if, what if, what if? You know, there's a million excuses for not trying something. But there's also a million rewards for stepping out in faith. So let's think about a what if you may not have considered. Here's something to ponder. What if you continued to do what you've been doing right now for the next six months? Or a year? Or five years? Letting current circumstances or past pain define you. Believing that you'll never do anything great because someone else says so. Where are you going to be? Stuck in the same dead-end job? Struggling in your relationships with friends and family? Living in a place, town, or environment that holds you back? Complacent about your hopes and dreams? Now, think about this. What if you follow the steps we've talked about? What's in store if you realize your true potential and begin to faithfully practice expectation therapy every day? Less stress, greater vision, specific goals, and a cleaner, clearer plan and purpose for your life. Are you going to have more peace mentally and physically? Maybe live according to your own values and designs. Will you become the architect of your own future? or allow fear to rob you of all that your destiny has for you. You know, sometimes I think about that nine-year-old boy at the top of that hill so many years ago. I wonder what my life would look like if I hadn't met Yoon or endured all the things that have fostered my resolve. Where would I be if I hadn't reached for, out for help? In reality, I would probably be stuck in that same little small town in upstate New York, working in a nowhere job or maybe unemployed, perhaps even an alcoholic like my dad was. Would I have served my country, discovered the love outside of myself, and married the two joys of my life? How do you take those first steps towards freedom? Find a quiet place in your office, your car, mountaintop, or maybe just be still. Close your eyes. Reflect deeply on how you want your life to be. What does it look like? What are you doing for a living? Who is part of it? Identify what it is that you most want in your life. Is it love, health, better finances, a childhood dream fulfilled, you know, and now you've just taken your first step out from under that black cloud 
And if you're ready to turn the corner in hopes and finding a new and brighter tomorrow, I can say with certainty that expectation therapy will help guide you there toward an amazing future where you meet each day with enthusiasm, spend time wisely in the pursuit of your passions, and to finally arrive at the place where the sun is shining for you. My passion comes from that I've lived this expectation therapy idea. I mean, I've lived it. It comes from deep inside of me. When I looked and, and I started reflecting on my life and I was wondering what it was, that one key element that has always kept me going. And I realized that it was my expectation that everything in the end was going to be okay. It's a way to live. It's really a way to live. And it just, it, it's very freeing uh, because I don't have worries. I don't worry about stuff. Uh, I just live. I just keep putting one foot in front of the other and having faith that it's going to be okay. And I understand that some people don't have the same faith that I have. But, you know, I've had, had conversations uh, with God about this, and he said to me one time, he said, uh, you know, faith comes in many forms. It isn't always faith in me, but it will always lead to me. Because once you start down a path of faith, be it in a, a counselor, a friend, yourself, a, f a family member, any of those things, other faiths other than a religious faith, is all leading you down the path to where we're supposed to be. It's all leading back to him. And that's what creates my passion because I know ultimately where I'm going to be.